So we're happy to uh, happy to answer any questions that anyone wants to throw at us. Mark, can you just share with us your thoughts after watching them, your team win all three games in San Diego before coming home? Well, it's great to be in San Diego and um, obviously in the win. But what struck me the most there, the uh, the club box is right next to the dugout. In fact, it's basically in the dugout is parallel. And you look at the spirit of those guys. Uh, it was really uh, it was very exciting to see. And, and, and interestingly, even when things were uh, – one of our players, I won't say who, was, was waving at a few pitches in game three that maybe he shouldn't have. And like eight guys up on the top step were, were barking at him like angrily. And I couldn't follow everything they were saying. But, uh, you know, there's some intensity there, too. It's not just about having fun. We heard that Craig told us that then the team gathered yesterday for a little dinner. Um, what was, you know, were you there for that? And, and sort of what did you, it was a rare Sunday off day, having an unprecedented opportunity to get everybody together. Yeah, Easter Sunday uh, off day. And so um, not sure if it was Dan LaRae's idea or who came up with the idea, but bring everybody together. Uh, this way the, the wives don't have to cook. Everyone can have a, a Easter dinner together. And uh, there was an Easter bunny and an Easter egg hunt on the field. And we actually that that evening have a, uh, a dinner for uh, close friends of the club and investors. And uh, you know, I sort of caught the end of the the uh, the, din the player dinner. And well, you know, I think I try hard to to balance, you know, being as involved and uh, with the team and and with the families as I can. But also, I think it's important for them to have their own space. So I didn't I didn't come for dinner. Also, at this point in life. Can't afford to eat two meals. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about the uh, your payroll is up this year. Can you talk about your attendance needs to break even? Are you prepared to lose money a little bit? Can you talk about how you make it work financially this year, please? Yeah, we're always prepared to lose money. I think one of the things about having a, an ownership group with some resources is we we as as David knows, because we he has the discipline where he asks for a budget. Uh, then I say no. Then he asks for a budget. And I say no. And I finally give him a budget. But uh, because I want to try to focus on what the right thing to do is for the team, and we uh, we sort of look at what the what we need to do for the team, and and then look at what we think the attendance might be or otherwise. And 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 sure, if you know you're going to add. You know, guys like Lorenzo Cain and Christian Yelich, you can we can budget attendance up a little bit, but we don't. Um, the, the math almost never works to uh, to say, well, we'll add this player and we'll make it up in attendance. So we uh, we just focus on on the baseball side of things and and then readjust the business budget, not not in the other direction. Mark, on that topic, do you think um, people have a hard time understanding your market sometimes because? Like even when you go to a hundred, you're at the bottom of the major league teams and payroll, and they want to know well, why can't they spend like that? Do you think people don't have trouble grasping what the restraints of this market is? You know, we try not to. Uh, you know, back to fourteen. This is uh, opening day number fourteen. I've I've really labored to not try to uh, categorize. You know, characterize the market. And uh, you know, the one time I remember I did an interview and I, I felt one of the, the best ways to connect with the fans in the community was to be transparent. And I actually walked through a recitation on, on how it works uh, between, you know, then you, you can improve the team, then you can make more money, you make more money, uh, you get, actually get a little less revenue sharing. I, I walked through this calculus, you know, somewhat uh, painstakingly. And all over the internet, there's people like my, my favorite comment show. I'll never forget. It was it was almost ten years ago. Said, "Hey, Mark, how about some uh, cheese with that wine?" Right? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, the fans don't. You know, they want to. They they. I think they care that I want to win. And in fact, if if there could be at least one I've read, a criticism of me as an owner is, uh, and I want to win too much and push too hard on the general managers to. Uh, to add players, and uh, so you know, I don't, I don't really. Uh, there's a group of teams 
you know, if you look at Major League Baseball, there's there's kind of in tiers, and there's you know, ten larger market teams, there's ten middle market teams, there's ten smaller market teams because of the support we get in this community from you know the fans, in terms of how many folks we have come in attendance, the sponsorship which has gone up every year, uh, and uh, you know, and and frankly. Um, you know, just the, the fact that we can now get players who want to come here because it's a great place to play and, and, and we can, uh, we, we punch above our weight. And, and, and I, I don't feel like we, I don't think we behave um, or think like a small market. And, and we know we know we're not a large market. On that topic, how you say you sort of have pushed the, your general managers to, to win, sort of win now. Did you do that after Kane and Yelich came? Did you push David to add another starting pitcher? I can. I, we should. We should ask David. Look, I think Mark's always been supportive of our baseball initiatives. Whenever we've come to him, with whether it's a signing or a transaction or a trade, um, regardless of what the financial pieces of those deals might be, um, if we want to do it from a baseball sense, Mark has been Mark has been supportive. We also understand we want to win for multiple years. This is a longer term uh, strategy. Our core focus is to create a team and an organization that can compete consistently in this division, a very well-run division, um, in certain cases a very well-financed division. We want to be competitive in this division year in and year out. Um, and so to some extent discipline and, and maybe restraint does come into play there and um, making sure that uh, we are setting the foundation for long-term success is, is a priority of mine. Both guys, one of the major challenges in this, though, is you're in the division with the Cubs, and, and your fans don't like losing to the Cubs, and they spend twice as much as you do, and therefore have way more margin for error on mistakes, contract mistakes. There's, do you guys think and talk about the inequity of that situation much? Look, I think we all, we get into the industry understanding that it's not a completely even playing field. Um, and we have to be okay with that. Um, we're certainly not going to use that as any sort of excuse. Both of us, our entire organization, firmly believes that we can and will win here. Um, and so with that mindset, it, it doesn't, it's not completely productive for us to, to spend time focusing on anything else. Yeah, my money management business, I compete. You know, uh, Crescent has about $26 billion in assets now. That's a big number, but it's a, a fraction of what firms like, you know, BlackRock and Blackstone have. And, you know, I, I feel in any any time we're in a head-to-head -head competition, I always feel like we're going to win. Uh, and so I, I like to feel that way here. And, uh, you know, look, every every team, if you look at the divisions, you know, there's – Nobody gets a, a pass, right? You've got the Yankees and the Red Sox. You've got the Dodgers. Um, you know, there's there's teams that every every club has you know has its challenges. And you know, there's most importantly, there's there's 30 teams that want to win, and uh, and and big baseball operations groups now trying to figure out how to do that. You're, you're on the executive council now, though, Mark. Do you, do you ever see a day when there would be anything close to complete revenue sharing so everybody's on the same playing field like in the NFL? You know, the uh, yeah, I am on the executive council now, and I think maybe one of the reasons is I understand the complexity. It, it's a multi-party uh, set of interests that have to get balanced. Um, you know, by the way, the, the big markets, the the larger markets, they, they have plenty of their own challenges. It's not, it is not easy to run a large market club. Uh, and, and then of course you have to consider the, the player's perspective as you balance everything. So, uh, you know, we have very, uh, you know, uh, Rob Manford as commissioner, uh, had 20 some odd years, uh, developing, uh, you know, balanced and, and under commissioner Sealy learn, learning all the different needs of the constituencies. And, you know, uh, it's not like we come together in a short period of time and, and address the CBA. We, we talk about it for, you know, well over a year in advance. And it's a, it's quite an interactive dialogue among the clubs. So, um, you know, we have a system that really, you know, has worked quite well. We've had labor peace for a long time. Uh, we've had, uh, a, you know, huge amount of uh, success uh, 
you know, among among the teams in terms of uh, interest in, in the sport. And um, however you want to define that, 75 million fans or, uh, you know, the, the kinds of content that we can provide in terms of media. So it's all, you know, there's, there's no reason from I, what I can see to reinvent the wheel. I think everybody always wants to make things better. And um, we try to address it from, frankly, we address it from 30 different points of view at, at the uh, ownership level. Mark, how attainable is uh, 3 million <clears throat> attendance this year? You know, I don't, I don't like to set attendance uh, thresholds the same way I don't like to set uh, budget, although, uh, you know, David pushes me on budget and Rick Schlesinger is over here pushes me on attendance. Uh, sometimes he may say I'm pushing him, but, uh, you know, our, our season ticket sales are up about 20% from last year. That doesn't mean our attendance would be up 20% because as, as a team, you know, outperformed expectation last year, we had uh, a lot of uh, second half increase in attendance that we wouldn't have expected. But we're, we're budgeted to about 2.7 or so. Uh, but we don't really, you know, we don't hang on those kind of numbers the same way I try not to hang on, on payroll numbers. We want to provide a quality entertainment product here, starting with the team on the field. Uh, we, you know, last year we, we spent upwards of $20 million improving our food service here to make it, you know, literally uh, you know, state of the art in baseball. Uh, this past season, we've upgraded all our, our team stores. I was in there last night. It's great. Let's encourage our fans to go check that out. And so we're, we're trying to focus qualitatively in, in that regard in every aspect of our business and then have the, the numbers follow. And the sponsorships with uh, Johnsonville and Aurora, how important were they in increasing <coughs> your uh, sponsorship revenue this year? You know, I, I think, I think again, we, we're trying to, at, at every at every step, we have a chance to uh, do something with sponsorships. We're very excited about about both of those, um, and really the all-encompassing nature of it. Not just oh, here's a, a number so that you can run some racing sausages. It, and and it's you know Johnsonville's been a Wisconsin company I think since the mid '40s, um, and and so that was important to us. You know, likewise, I think Aurora is uh, going to help us uh, in terms of transporting people into the games who you know, or, or in as ambulatory as, as say, uh, Mr. Stearns is. Uh, was, you should see him out there running. and uh, <laughs> It's around pretty well. So, uh, but all kidding aside, we, we look to have partners. Like, uh, when we think of sponsors, we really think of having partners. And, and I think Johnsonville and, and Aurora are going to be really good partners for the Milwaukee Brewers. Mark, how do you feel about where you're positioned to add in season th this year if, uh, if a significant piece becomes available that would cost a bit? You know, I, I think it's interesting, and I was reflecting on that because I asked Tyler Barnes, what do you think they're going to ask? And say, oh, they're going to ask about midseason. I think the biggest challenge is going to be more for, for David uh, in terms of the, the kinds of prospects we have that he might be willing to let go or, or not be willing to let go as it is you know, financially, if you, if you look at, you know, the simple math at mid you know, by the July trade deadline, it's really only a third of the season left. So if you had a $20 million contract, it's $6 million that year. Um, so we don't think that, you know, and now, of course, if it's a long-term contract, you have to, you have to think about that. But I, I think it's as much how we're going to balance, you know, the, the prospects we have. We, we, even after the Christian Yelich trade, I think we have a very, very strong farm system and a lot of uh, players who may even help us this year, so it's going to be that that balance as as much for a team that expects to compete for you know a number of years now, not just this year. David, on that same vein, do you feel like at some point you'll have to do something with just the number of outfielders you have? And the other popular thing is obviously pitching, which has so far been great. But do you feel like you'll have to do something in either one of those two departments? We'll, we'll let the season play out and and take it as as it comes. Um, you know, I, I said throughout the offseason, we didn't think we had an outfield problem. We think we have outfield depth, and I'll reiterate that right now. All of the guys that we were talking about throughout spring training who are here in AAA, if they all remain in our organization, they're all going to play for us this year. We're, we're going to have injuries. Um, they happen every single year. All these guys will, will wear Brewers uniforms. If the right deal comes along, obviously you guys know me, and, and I'm willing to pull the trigger. So um, we're just going gonna to let it play out. I'm very comfortable with our organizational depth as a whole. We've worked hard to get to this place, and so I'm not really looking to remove it. 
Mark, David is sort of, uh, the expectation around the game was you would add more pitching right after you got Kane and Yelich. Um, and he's, do you think he likes thinking out of the box a little bit or going sort of against what the, he's sitting there, I'm sorry to ask this, so he's sitting right there. But you know, I'm thinking of like the Eric Thames acquisition was a little bit outside of the box. Maybe adding Kane and Yelich was a little outside of the box. In your interactions with him, do you think he likes those sorts of moves? I think the whole, you know, he's got a group. How many folks in, in baseball ops you'd say work, you know, uh, I know there's different tiers, but if you go in that bullpen, there's got to be 20. 20 some odd, yep. yeah. You got 20 really, really smart uh, people up there um, who are all thinking as creatively as they can to, uh, you know, make the team better. And and what, what, what they do is, you know, they really don't take a day off. Maybe... Well, maybe Easter. Maybe when you're three and zero at, at Easter Sunday, you take a day off, and maybe at Christmas. But um, you know, so, and, and every year, if you notice, like we had a, a Jennings this year, uh, right before the season started, they're, they're, any way they can make the team better. Um, and it's interesting because uh, you know you, you could see uh, the Yelich trade developing and, and the Kane negotiations developing, and all of a sudden, it looked like they were going to land at the same time. And I, I asked David, "Do you? Uh, well, what, what do you do now? Um, do you, you know, back off on one in order to choose the other?" And, and he said, "No, it just increases his desire to get both players." And uh, because when, clearly, if you can add Christian Yelich and Lorenzo Cain, your team is going to be better. And and then all the other questions, you know, what, how many outfielders, and well, the team is just much better. And, and you really, it is very rare to add. Uh, either one of those types of players in terms of talent. And, and so then you, uh, and obviously he, you know, knows, we knew we could keep all the outfielders. I think some of the teams out there didn't maybe think so. Uh, and we knew, we knew we could. And, you know, David and Matt do a really good job managing the roster. And, and frankly, if you look at other clubs that have had success, and let's look at the World Series teams, the Astros and, and the Dodgers are really smart about managing their rosters. And that means that a uh, you know, player who could really end up performing in the World Series and adding value in the World Series might be in the minor leagues for part of that year. And, and so we, uh, you know, I think David and Matt are, are doing the same thing. Mark, have you been able to get a pulse on just how excited Milwaukee is and just with the three and all start kind of fueling the hype or the, 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 or the energy, so to speak? More and more. Uh, and uh, I, I know I know Joe uh, Tory was coming anyway, but I do notice that Joe's here at a, a year that we're a good team, <laughs> not a rebuilding year. Told you that before. I, these next these last three games. That that is true. I was going to be here, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's not like he uh, that that is correct. Just for the record, Joe Tory, uh, who, as everyone knows, I should not have said. Uh, it, actually, I was thinking, you know, your your legend eclipsed your playing days in Milwaukee. Uh, it was nice to have a photo op with uh, the Milwaukee Braves catching tandem of Torrey and Euchre. Um But a lot of home runs between and that catching tandem. Yeah, I did all, all of them. them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but, you know, the excitement, uh, yes, you can, you can, I felt it in spring training from fans. There were a lot of Milwaukee fans who came out in San Diego. That door hole section behind the dugout, not opening day, because the Padres fans take those tickets. It was there were hundreds of Brewers fans there, and uh, a, a number of fans want to take a picture or shake hands, sign an autograph. So I finally asked guys near the top of the row. I said, "Let me ask a question. If we were zero two and not two and zero. Do you want to take the picture?" Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, all, all kidding aside, I think I think David uh, and the group um, they, David assembled an exciting team. And, uh, and and by the way, I should mention that that you know Craig counsel in that because you know Craig makes us an attractive place to play, and uh, you know David when we're going to make David has a final decision obviously, but he he talks to Craig about everything that we're looking to do and and gets his input. David, what what are your impressions? I know it's only three games, but after watching that opening series, where, what did you think? Look, anytime you're three and zero, you're happy if you're if you're in my seat. I think we've got a team that plays hard. I think we've got a pretty balanced team. Um, we've obviously had some guys play really well through those first couple of games in in Lorenzo and Christian, and so that's 
That's that's good to see. You know, I think we're going to we're going to win games in a variety of different ways this year. We're going to rely on our, our offense certain amounts. We're going to rely on our pitching, our bullpen. Um, we're probably a little bit more balanced team than we have been uh, in the past, at least over the last couple of years. The development with Kane and Yelich as that one-two. Mark was telling us you were going for both, hoping you maybe get one when you got both. Did you have that in mind of how they've become a really nice one-two in that lineup? Sure. Yeah. No. We. I mean, we were, we were going for both, hoping we get both. Um, I, I think the the goal here was to improve our team as as much as we possibly could, um, and and being able to add two really valuable pieces like that in one off season forget one day was was really beneficial for the club so it, obviously an exciting day um, what's most exciting for me is we have them here for both five years um, and that played a large part into this 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 is I've mentioned it before but this is a long-term strategy this is a multi-year competitive strategy um, and both of those players can contribute for multiple seasons maybe one or two more mark you you were talking to, mark you were talking about the get together the team and had you say but you were telling us in San Diego about you're uh, running your Seder on a Saturday night. Uh, <laughs> Friday night. Excuse me. Friday. <laughs> and then what, what that was like while trying to do that bit of family business and try to see what the Brewers were doing with a five-run ninth inning. Could you just talk about the timing of how that yeah, worked we, we have an interfaith marriage. I grew up Italian Catholic and Debbie's Jewish. Um, I, uh, as she started running, uh, the, having the Seders at home instead of at friends' houses, over time, I uh, I took you know charge of, of running the say now I had a lot of uh, what I, the good news I have a lot of notes from her. Bad news is I don't have the transliterations of the prayers. Uh, so sometimes it sounds a little like Bob Euchre trying to uh, say a, a Hebrew prayer. But um, my son Dan was sitting next to me, and he was whispering the score to me, and so I would pepper the seder with you know and and. You know, and why are we here tonight? And by the way, the Brewers are up one nothing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Who is the wise child? The Brewers are now up two nothing. But uh, uh, as the the game went in the other direction, uh, the updates got less frequent. Then people who were there, we have thirty five people, start asking, "How's the game going?" I'm a little more muted. Anyway, the Seder finishes at at the uh, at the bottom of the eighth inning. So a group of us go to watch the game in the bottom of the eighth. And we literally walk in with the bases loaded, and uh, and then we make that great relay, you know, Christian and, and Orlando, and and so now we're down three runs. And th not everybody there is a baseball fan, especially my uh, my daughter-in-law and our grandson will be here today. So our daughter-in-law is a poet, and she's not yet fully up to baseball curve. So she's watching the game, and you know, it's just three runs. She doesn't know that it's hard to get three runs in the ninth inning against one of the best closers in baseball. And, and the excitement builds. And then even folks who weren't that uh, versed in baseball are superstitious. They're not moving. Predictably, we load the bases. Debbie leaves the room, says, I can't take it. <laughs> so my, my wife, uh, is, folks here know Debbie, uh, it's too much stress. Anyway, when Ryan hits the home run, we're all screaming, screaming. Debbie comes running, what happened? <laughs> And Elizabeth said to me, I didn't realize baseball was so exciting. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Craig uh, Council told me that a, an ending like that happens pretty much every five years, maybe. So, uh, yeah, but we'll, we'll, uh, if David likes to say we'll take it. Um, and it made for a very exciting end to our Seder. And, uh, yeah, maybe the Passover prayers helped. <laughs> David, uh, last year a lot of guys, I don't want to say career years, but like Chase Anderson was, was very good. Eric Thames kind of came out of nowhere. What did, in your guys' analysis, what led you, led you to believe to trust them and, and a lot of guys on your roster, their progression as opposed to guarding against that of, um, you know, that maybe that was a career year for them and they could slide back? I think there's a, there's a lot that goes into the analysis of every single player. And those you mentioned, those guys are, are in the primes of their careers or they're just entering the primes of, of their careers. Or in the case of Eric, had taken a little bit of a sabbatical from a major league career and, and was just coming back. So there, there are reasons for all of those players why we think they can sustain or even improve. Um, we also are very aware that sometimes players take a step back or two or sometimes players have a down year. Um, frankly, that's where all this depth that I keep talking about uh, comes in um, and, and allows you to 
uh, maybe plug some holes that at the outset of a season you weren't sure were there? 